Apparently, this was not done by accident. It is written that the Susquehannock turned the land surrounding their city into a massive farmland, laying the land flat, removing any obstacles, and planting hundreds of thousands of crops. Have you ever heard of the Lancaster Amish or the Lancaster Mennonite? Or the hundreds of old world Amish style farms in Lancaster? Have you heard that Lancaster has some of the richest soil in all the world and has a perfect location for agricultural development? Well, it seems we have the Susquehanna Native Americans to thank for that, as they spent hundreds of years reshaping and tending the land of Lancaster, which surrounded the capital of their kingdom. Now, I believe the last thing I'd like to discuss and this will be the real meat and potatoes of the video, are two aspects within these journals that really stood out to me. One, we are told the Susquehannock indigenous people dyed their skin. While many indigenous people are often depicted in old paintings and artwork as wearing body paint and war paint, we are actually told here that the Susquehannock took it one step further and actually had a process for dyeing their skin to appear darker. In this account, it is written that most Susquehannock children were light-skinned or white and have a pale complexion, but through years of ritual dyeing of the skin, it turned to a darker shade. This becomes especially important when we contrast that with the ancient accounts of giants in America. Those specimens that have been found in burial mounds all throughout this country, being skeletons of rather large proportions, generally over six feet tall, we can now tie those burial mounds to the ancient Native American mound builders, who, through the Susquehannock, we can also tie to having a naturally lighter complexion and possibly red hair. We are told the Susquehannocks, for the most part, also had the same features of these ancient giants. The last part I want to mention here is the deal that I found described between the Maryland colony and the Susquehannock indigenous people. We are told once the European settlers arrived to America, trade with the indigenous people blossomed. While this is initially true, one of the main reasons the Native Americans agreed to trades with the Europeans was to brandish firearms for themselves. Essentially, in this narrative, in these journals, we are led to believe the Susquehannock alone ruled the Northeast and the other Native groups were always unable to conquer the Susquehanna, and this occurred for centuries. We are also told that the Susquehanna had projectile weapons, including cannons and guns. The other nations the Susquehannock had subjugated for decades finally had the ability to gather firearms for themselves, and thus they began to trade with the Europeans. Once the other nations had armed themselves to the T, they essentially banded together to go to war with the Susquehannock. Still, Susquehannock rule persisted. As I mentioned in previous videos, the Susquehannock had close relationships with both the Swedish or New Sweden, and the Dutch or New Amsterdam. However, I did not know how deep this connection actually went. First, we have the sale of New York, more specifically of Staten Island and the surrounding area to the Dutch. And this was attributed to the chiefs of the Susquehannock. Basically, the Susquehannock are the ones who traded the land of New York to the Dutch to begin with. And that's something I'd never heard mentioned before. And continuing into these agreements between the Susquehannocks and the European settlers, we also have the arming of the other nations of indigenous people, those nations that were not the Susquehanna. Those nations then agreed to band together, essentially, to try to take out the Susquehanna. Mind you, as we mentioned earlier, the Susquehannock had been subjugating these other nations for quite a long period of time, for centuries even. So... Once these other nations finally received firearms from the Europeans, they decided to use them against the Susquehanna. Now where this becomes interesting is while the Europeans traded these firearms to the other nations, they also offered the Susquehanna their protection. And this is where it gets really interesting because the deal that was made in Maryland, 
essentially offered the Susquehanna protection and the Susquehanna could even live in the new European cities in America. However, the deal stipulated that the Susquehanna had to agree to help build all of the cities and all of the roads. So again, when we look into ancient history, we've always wondered how much of a role did the indigenous people of certain areas play in the construction of that area? We often see the earthworks and other things like that being torn down or being built on top of. Well, in the case of Lancaster and the Maryland colony and the surrounding area, we have the Susquehannocks actually making an agreement with the European settlers to protect the Susquehannock from the firearms that the other indigenous people had acquired. These Susquehannocks then agreed to build out the cities and to build out the roads of these new European cities. And we already mentioned just how large the Susquehannocks are in stature and physical prowess. Now we can imagine that they could have been the muscle behind a lot of the infrastructure within these major cities. So we have this agreement, we have the sale of New York, we have all of this importance that is put on the Susquehanna, and yet something happens that really leaves us with a lot of questions. That is, the Susquehanna capital city that was in Lancaster is eventually sold or traded to the European settlers. From there, the Susquehanna actually leave Lancaster for the most part, and from here it says that they are essentially hunted down by the other indigenous people. We have the Susquehanna seemingly leaving behind their capital city of Conestogue in Lancaster County, as well as a massive barge boat which they are said to have created to cross the Susquehanna River. Now, the Susquehanna River is very wide. It is over one mile wide. And that is why we talk about the bridge and the ferry that existed here. We have in the year of 1726, Wright's Ferry being established where the Susquehanna capital once stood. In my previous video, we discussed the ferry seeming to predate the opening of the land to European settlers. And now we know why. Wright's Ferry was originally a Susquehanna crossing point with a boat run by the Susquehanna nation leading to their capital city. Now there is little, if anything, that remains in the area of Columbia or Wrightsville that involves Susquehanna history. Now the last thing I want to talk about is the bridge that crossed the Susquehanna, which I mentioned in previous videos. This bridge was at the exact location of Wright's Ferry. Wright's Ferry being at the location of the ancient Susquehanna capital city. The ancient bridge, which is dated to 1812, actually has foundations that are still visible today. These foundations stretch across the width of the Susquehanna River for over one mile. Knowing what we know now, one can only wonder, with this confirmed location of the Susquehanna capital being right on top of this location, could the bridge foundations actually be from the previous Susquehanna civilization? I'll complete this narrative as the history books do, essentially telling us that by the mid 1700s, the Susquehanna numbers dwindled so much and their nation became so small in number that they had little to offer in the ways of trade or labor. Their last gasp at survival was to contact the local and somewhat new Lancaster government roughly in the year 1763. The Lancaster government was residing on the ancient sacred Susquehanna lands. The Susquehanna pleaded with the Lancaster government for protection from the other newly armed Native American groups. Lancaster set up a makeshift home inside the Lancaster County prison for the Susquehanna. The Lancaster County prison at the time was also a very interesting fortified castle-like structure, which was also possibly built by the earlier Susquehanna. In the year of 1763, a Susquehanna hate group known as the Paxton Boys weaseled their way into the Lancaster County prison and ruthlessly slaughtered and killed what remained of every single Susquehanna Native American. This was the last major blow to the Susquehanna population. Having seen their kingdom shrunk down to the small area of Lancaster, and then finally to just an area inside the Lancaster prison, with the Paxton boys attack in 1763, the Susquehanna and their history were all but wiped out. 
The history we have today, especially in modern day history books, is minimal at best. The once glorious Susquehanna, which ruled the northeast of America with an iron thumb, have all but been forgotten in modern times. Their castles, their fortifications, their ancient quarries and forges, their land works and mounds, their agriculture and their reshaping of the land, their overall size and stature, their kingdom in Lancaster, all of these things seemingly forgotten between layers of more recent indigenous history. But let it be known, according to these journals and these books from the 1700s and earlier, by all accounts, there was one indigenous nation which for hundreds of years claimed superiority over all others. That was the Susquehannock. Their massive size, their ability to build, their war knowledge, their ruthlessness and superiority only seems to echo other fallen nations we can find throughout the world. The warriors of the Susquehannock would find a perfect seat at the table right next to the warriors of the likes of Rome. And yet, we hear far more about the Romans than we will ever hear about the Susquehannocks. Yet both seem to dramatically shape the continent of which they came. So hopefully that was enjoyable or informative for you. In my head, I made literally thousands of ties to other old world concepts and I know I was not able to cover all of those in this video. I would love to hear if you go ahead and read through any of these old books and these journals. If you find anything in particular that stands out, I would love to hear about it in the comment section down below. So please leave us a link or possibly tell us what page you found that on and we can all go check it out together. I'd also love to hear what you think about the ancient kingdom of the Susquehannock in general and what you think about the area of Lancaster, Pennsylvania, basically hiding away all of this history. Being from Lancaster myself, I can tell you this was probably the most eye-opening of all the research I have done so far. Many of the questions I had throughout my life, including questions involving architecture and agriculture, as well as questions about the seemingly man-made ruins throughout the Lancaster forests and hiking trails, have been somewhat answered through the Susquehannock narrative. Essentially, we have the most powerful indigenous group in America pre-1700 up until the introduction of firearms that resided in a fortified town on the cliffs of what is today Lancaster. But even as this location is full of general mystery, it is certain that every day that I get up and I walk outside, I am walking over land that was shaped and plowed by the Susquehannocks before me, and for that, I am eternally grateful. So in conclusion, please leave your thoughts and your comments down below. I will leave links for you to check out some of my other work on these subjects. And I will also leave links to some of the books that I've discussed, especially the one that involved all of these different journal entries that I've referenced in the video. I can't wait to get back into this history very soon. I hope you enjoyed today's video. Please hit the like button if you did, subscribe if you'd like more content like this, and I will see you very soon on the next one.